Well, good morning. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord with you this morning. Uh, I, I will tell you, you can't count on anyone. Uh, Randy told me he was afraid that he was going to have to preach and he didn't have a sermon prepared, and I told him to be in, se in season and out of season. Turn with me to Romans in chapter 10. I've got verses 14 and 15 up there concerning a saving message, but I want to back up and read verse 13. Verse 13 is kind of the defining moment of several rhetorical questions that Paul is going to present in, in verse 14. Uh, and he, he, quotes, uh, he quotes from an Old Testament prophet in verse 15, but actually he quotes from Joel in verse uh, 15. But as we look at the rhetorical questions that he posed in verse 14, we've got to understand what Paul, or how Paul, or in the context in which Paul is addressing. In verse 13, this is very important, friends. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 9, we, we talked about verse 9 last week, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So Paul addresses the whosoever. Now, as we know, as we've been studying through Romans, Paul is addressing primarily a Jewish culture, a Jewish group of people. And he's addressing the fact that God has sent not only the, the gospel message to the Jew first, but he's also sent it to the Gentiles. The Jews couldn't understand how God could save these old heathen Gentiles. And just to, just to uh, put it very simply, Paul says it's because of God's grace. Because of God's grace. And he mentions that whosoever in verse 13. And he begins to pose these rhetorical questions in verse 14. That he might point out a clear presentation of the gospel must precede. That is, go before a true saving faith. If you're here today and you're a born again believer, you have a saving message that God has planted upon your heart. He's given you a call, a commission, to share that saving message with those, whomever they may be, that you come into contact with. I like what Hodges' commentary says. He says, Paul considered it as involved in what he had already said, and especially, this is in regards to verse 14 and 15, and especially in the predictions of the ancient prophets, that it was the will of God that all men should call upon Him. This being the case, he says, he argues to prove that it was His will that the Gospel should be preached to all. So let's read verses 14 and 15 together. How then shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? In verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Let's bow in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in our place. We thank You for the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. We thank You that Your Spirit has called us through Your Word to be saved. And Lord, we pray if there be any here who do not know You, Lord, that they would respond today to the Spirit's call. Lord, we ask that everything in this place that we do, from the words that we sing to the words that are spoken, and read that they bring glory to your name, that you be lifted up. Lord, help us that we might understand the message that you've given us to proclaim to all the world. Forgive us where we fall short, Lord. Correct us when we do wrong. Lead us down the path of righteousness for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to point out to you in, in Paul's rhetorical questions here that he poses in verse 14, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Paul says, Paul wants us to understand that there must be a clear message in order for people to be saved. Uh, as, as I often put it, I'm, I'm from South Arkansas and I'll just put it in simple layman's terms because I are simple. What Paul is saying is, it's a simple message. The gospel is simple. 
And yet so many people, especially in the days of Jesus, in the days of the apostles, in the days in which Paul was writing from Ephesus to the church at Rome, there were so many people who, who thought that it was some intellectual status that they must attain in order to gain righteousness, in order to be considered a child of the King, in order to enter into heaven. But Paul makes it very clear that in that clear message that these people must call on Him. What is it verse 13 says once again? For whosoever call, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Albert Barnes writes in his notes on the New Testament, he said his doctrine was that faith in Christ was essential to justification and salvation and that this was needful for all. So many people are walking around today who profess to be Christian and yet they have never called on the name of Jesus. They think that because they believe in the existence of Jesus, they believe that He did once live and die on this earth, they believe that He walked, that He was a carpenter's son, that He was born of Joseph and Mary, that that makes them a Christian. But in fact, calling on Him, and I want you to notice this, that there's something about calling on the name of the Lord that makes it personal. It's not something corporately that we do in regards to our personal salvation, but it's something that each and every individual does in regards to their personal salvation. Shall call on Him. I'm reminded of the time, and many of you are familiar with the passage in which Jesus had gone up into the mountain. He had fled, or uh, He had gotten away from the crowds as they were pressing in on Him. He instructed His disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and during that night. During that night, there was a great tempestuous storm that, uh, that fell upon the ship in which the disciples were riding and Jesus, uh, Jesus came walking on the water. They first thought it was some apparition, some ghost. And Jesus told them, be not afraid, it is I. In other words, he was telling his disciples, listen guys, it's me. It's the Messiah. It's your Lord. It's the one whom you've been following now for these past two to two and a half years. And old Peter, you got to love Peter. Peter says, King James English, Lord, if it is thee, bid me come unto thee. And so Jesus simply says this one word, come. Peter steps out of the boat. He begins to walk on the water. And the waves begin crashing at his feet. And Peter begins, rather than looking at Jesus, he looks at the waves and he begins to sink. And he cries out these three, Lord, these three words, Lord, save me. Now we know that Peter could be pretty selfish at times. And at times he could just be outright rowdy. He could have cried out, Lord, save us. Lord, you see, you see those guys in the boat? Save them. But no, Peter made it personal because you see, he understood. He recognized the fact that he was the one that was sinking. The boat was still floating. Peter began to understand, or he understood that he was in much dire strait. He would suffer much more severe consequences than those who were continually bailing the water out of the boat. He understood they had a little more time, but his time was now. And so he cried out, Lord, save me. He didn't holler at the guys in the other boat, hey guys, pray for me. God might save me. He didn't bellow out the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He didn't pull out his beads. He didn't rebuke the waves. But rather, he looked to the Savior. And he called on him. Secondly, Peter points out for us in order, in order for people to understand 
the clear message. They've not only got to call on Him, but they've got to believe in Him. In verse 9, as we pointed out, Paul writes, he says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you realize that the resurrection is a pivotal point in Christianity? Buddha's dead. Muhammad is dead. All of those images in which the pagans have worshipped are dead. If Jesus had never risen from the grave, we would have no hope. And therefore, the word gospel, meaning good news, it would not exist. But today we have the good news of the gospel that Jesus lives. And therefore we can, we can sing the song. Thank you, Jesus. Because that blood was not only applied, but that body was resurrected from the dead. And every, every man, woman, boy, and girl must put their faith and trust in Him to save them. The second thing I want to point out in regards to the rhetorical questions that Paul poses, he says in verse 14, the middle of that verse, And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear Without a preacher. Now many, many pastor like, uh, preachers like to take that verse out of context and they want to point to the, to the pulpit and they want to say, well, you know what? God has called me to preach the gospel. And that's true. But God has also called me to equip the saints that they might preach the gospel. And I want you to notice the first question that he poses, the only question that he poses in verse 15 is this. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Paul points out that the person who preaches the gospel is sent. It's someone who is sent from God. In Southern Baptist circles, we often refer to the Great Commission in Matthew in chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, where it says this. Go... Ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. One translation puts that first phrase this way. So wherever you go. Another translation puts it this way. You go. Many people would point out that that, that phrase, King James English, go ye therefore, or you go, not you go the car. Some of you don't remember the you go cars. But he points out that not only is salvation something that is personal, but the gospel is something that we should take personal as well as the message that Jesus has bestowed upon us as Christians. And we've got to understand that the Great Commission is not isolated. At that point in which Jesus gave the Great Commission, the church, the New Testament church, was very, very small. Isn't it amazing that when, when those people who heard those words were scattered abroad as a result of persecution that would take place, that everywhere they went, they shared the message, the good news, the gospel that Jesus said. And my friends, that was more, that's more than just uh, living it out. Well, I just like to let people see Jesus living in me. That's fertilizer. I don't know how, how else to put it.
You know what fertilizer does when there's no seed planted? Absolutely nothing. Except it will cause the weeds to grow. It will cause the weeds to grow. Years ago when I <clears throat> lived in South Arkansas, we had a pasture out there beside our house and <clears throat> I thought it would be good. We lived in the community of Hicks. We were Hicks of the community. And I thought it would be good to have some chicken litter spread on our, on our pasture. After all, it makes everything grow and turns it really, really green, really, really fast. Now, the neighbors weren't too pleased. Uh, we had people living uh, right next door to the pasture in which I had the chicken litter spread on. The problem was, and, and it didn't make the grass grow, but it also caused the weeds to grow as well. And you know what happens if you allow weeds to go unchecked? It will choke the good stuff out. And so, my friends, if we go around this world simply thinking that Jesus lives in us, and, you know, we're the light of the world, and that's as far as we go, without sharing the message of the gospel, then all we've done is simply fertilize the weeds. Because let me tell you the first thing that someone is going to say. And I've heard this numerous, numerous times. Well, I'm just as good as sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so that goes to that church. They're nothing but hypocrites. Or I do good. I serve in this community or I serve on this board. I've never mistreated anyone or had any malcontent toward anyone. I think that, I think that, uh, yeah, I'm good enough to go to heaven. You see, that puts the merit of salvation based upon one's own morality and not upon the blood of Jesus. We've got to understand that when we present the gospel message, it's about the gospel of grace. And by the way, in one particular passage, we find it referred to as the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. As a matter of fact, if we look at verse 15, that's how it refers to them, to it. How beautiful, and remember he's quoting the Old Testament, Joel. This proves to me that grace was evident in the Old Testament. He said, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Do you realize that the gospel of peace, that's what this world needs now? The world needs to know that there is a way out of all of this chaos. That there is a means of escape of trial and tribulation and temptation. That we may be in the third or fourth quarter of the game, folks. But we're not defeated yet. Because victory is coming. <laughs> victory is coming. Everybody was praising the hogs yesterday. Y'all know they had a bye week yesterday, don't you? I also want you to know this, that the person who is sent is prepared with the gospel. Interesting to note that when Jesus sent the, the disciples out two by two, and you find this story in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You don't find it in the gospel of John, but you do find it in the first three gospels. That he instructed them, we find specifically in Matthew and, cha and chapter 10, that he instructed them Carry any of the personal script. Don't even, don't carry anything with you. Don't even carry a change of clothes. He was addressing the issue of 
taking the gospel from every place, potentially every place that would receive it. He was also addressing the issue of certain persecution that would take place. There would be some who would not want to hear the gospel of peace. The saving message. And he instructed his disciples in whatever town that they went in who wouldn't receive their message to simply shake the dust off their feet as a testimony to them. In biblical days, when someone would shake the dust off their feet, it was meant to be the greatest of insults. When those who would persecute the disciples as they were sent out two by two came closely upon them, Jesus instructed them to flee to another city. In other words, go to another place, but keep, keep proclaiming the message. Many would say today, well, you know, preacher, I, I, I haven't been called to preach. Yes, you have. You might not have been called to, to fill the pulpit. You might not have been, been called to pastor the church, but you have been called to declare the message. And you can do that. You may say, well, preacher, I don't know the scripture as well as you do. Well, one solution, study it. But until that time, Use your own personal testimony of how God takes the vilest of sinners and changes their heart and makes them righteous in the eyes of God. <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some of you may have heard of him. He was alive during World War II. He protested against the Nazis. They imprisoned him. While he was in prison, he wrote some of the greatest theological uh, articles that one has ever read. He coined a term that has come to characterize much of evangelical Christianity. And it's the term cheap grace. Cheap grace. <coughs> Cheap grace simply defined means the justification of sin without the justification of the sin. A, a modern term that we often hear, that we often use is easy believism. Many professing Christians today utterly ignore the biblical truth that grace instructs us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, to live righteously and godly. As a matter of fact, Paul, who not only wrote the book of Romans, he wrote half, at least half, of what we consider as the New Testament. Paul wrote to Titus, and he referred to him as my son. He said in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 through 15, he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Friends, we don't teach, we don't preach an easy believism that's presented in a way in which people think that they get a get out of jail free card. That's monopoly terminology. But many people today, and I, I'm, I'm saddened to say, many people today propose an easy believism that Listen, Jesus saves, and if you'll just believe in Him, He can save you too. And they never go on with the, the end 
of the Great Commission. They think that their, their portion is simply done. And they say, they use the, the terminology and say, well, we've planted a seed. We've planted a seed. They present a ticket, no strings attached, open-ended package, as one writer put it, of amnesty, indulgence, forbearance, charity, leniency, immunity, approval, tolerance. And self-awarded privilege, which is separate from any legitimate biblical demand. Let me tell you where I come to that conclusion. Right here. Right here. Don is, Brother Don Cochran has often shared about his show pig. You know, I had a lot in common. When I was in high school, I, I showed pigs as well through the FFA. I shared with an ag kid, that I was an ag kid. I happened to win the Grand Reserve Champion. I won Reserve Champion at the County Fair my senior year. When we went to the District Fair, I won Grand Reserve. <coughs> By the time we got to uh, the state fair in Little Rock, my pig kind of developed some issues. Didn't quite place as high as I uh, had in the county and the district fair, but I did manage to, uh, did manage to place third in showmanship. And if you, any of you have ever been to the state fair, you know how many kids are showing pigs. So I thought that was a great honor. But as Brother Don spoke about his, his show pig, you know, I was reminded about mine. We paid so much attention to these show pigs. We fed them certain feeds. We groomed them a certain way. And, you know, we had to have clippers. We'd clip their hair, you know. And we'd put this stuff on them, on their hair and on their hide, just to make them shine. I mean, there was just a, a glimmer when that hog walked across the show ring. But inevitably, every time that we got that pig back home to the pen, he headed for the biggest hog wall that he could find. You see, why was that? Because he was still a pig. Still a hog. Friend, we must understand that as we propose the gospel message, a clear saving message. Yes, it is, it is by grace, through faith, that we're saved. It is because of unmerited favor that God has chosen to save us. God, in other words, God saved us in spite of ourselves. But God also changes us. He takes the whole out of the whole world. And he puts that shine on us and in us. You see that hog shined on the outside. It was a prize hog at the county and the district fair. But the inside never changed. Thirdly, Paul points out that that is a true saving faith. So what is a saving faith? Well, according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, saving faith, the first and foremost faith that is in, that is in Jesus Christ. The only faith which unites soul to salvation is faith in the Lord Jesus.
Such faith is further understood as a saving grace whereby we receive, according to the Catechism, and rest upon Christ alone for salvation. Not according to our own preferences or ideas or ideologies or inventions, but rather as He has offered to us, and I quote, in the Gospel. You see, saving grace, the saving faith, it is a gift from God. You've heard me quote Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 quite often. For by grace through faith we say, verse 9, for not of works lest any man should boast. You see, God gives us, He gives us that salvation through faith. And let me point this out. It's not faith in Muhammad or faith in Buddha or, or faith in any image or faith in, in your family or faith in your heritage or faith in, in any other thing apart from faith in Christ. Luke writes for us in Acts in chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, I often stir up gospel conversations with people by asking them, where do you go to church? Or where do you serve the Lord? If they tell me they're a Christian, I'll say, where do you serve the Lord? Because I believe it's every Christian's responsibility to know that they're called and sent for the gospel of peace. And we can only do such things as God has called us to the local church. To serve. To serve. My challenge to you today would be, Christian, if you're here, For you to understand that you have not only been called, but you have been sent with a saving message to proclaim. Let me point back to the Great Commission. I shared with you how some translations have pointed out the King James Version says, Go ye, therefore. Another translation says, So wherever you go, another translation puts it this way. As you are going. To me, that points out it's not an option. It's not an option. It's imperative. But as you are going, that also points to, point, points to the fact that is an active phrase, an active verb tense. It means that we're not to sit idly by. We're to constantly be moving. And as you go, teach and baptize. And that word teach is more. It's more than just simply teaching a lesson. I know we've got several teachers and former teachers in the congregation. And at one point or the other, all of us have sat under a teacher. Do you know what the objective is of teaching? That the student might gain knowledge. That would help them further in life. Now granted, there are many subjects out there today, especially in modern school teaching systems that uh, probably are useless. But you see, when a teacher gets up to teach, the objective of that teacher is that their students might gain knowledge to help them further in their lives. 
Our purpose is not simply to get up and speak, but to teach. That's why, that's why Matthew, that's why Matthew in verse 20 includes these words of Jesus, this teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. In other words, making disciples. I've often heard it put this way. You know, you know what a who begat sheep? Other sheep. Other sheep. It's not the shepherd. It's the sheep. Now that doesn't that doesn't relinquish your pastor's responsibility to remember his sheeping skills as well. Be prepared for the gospel. Present the gospel. It's a saving way and instruct that person that God not only washes the outside, He washes the inside. Sin is inherently, sin is inherent. That's why in the Old Testament, God talked about removing the stony heart and giving His people a heart of flesh. Little stony heart represented hardness and sinfulness, self righteousness. But a heart of flesh is tender and compassionate. It promotes blood flow throughout the body. The body grows and matures for service. When was the last time you shared the saving message that Jesus saves? When was the last time that you shared the message that Jesus changes us? If we want to see more people saved, and fewer people die and go to hell, it's going to take as we are going sharing the gospel. Friend, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, remember I said that Peter made it personal. I said, Lord, save me. You know, there's been much controversy over the last several years, the last probably the last 20 years, especially in Southern Baptist circles, I can say that because I are one, over the sinner's prayer and having someone to repeat after you. Now, I'm not really big on the sinner's prayer or having someone to repeat after me. I do believe in the sinner's prayer. But I'm not going to sit up here and stand up here and lead you and say, repeat after me. Jesus didn't look at Peter and say, okay, Peter, listen, I want you to repeat after me. If you want me to snatch you up out of those waves, if you want me to jerk you up on your feet, if you want me to put you back in the boat, then repeat after me. No. Peter knew the eminence of his death if he did not cry out personally, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. So oftentimes when I lead people to Christ, and I ask them, have you prayed that the Lord would save you? They say, well, I don't know how. I said, well, tell the Lord what's on your heart. You recognize the fact that you're a sinner in need of salvation and that you cannot save yourself. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and save you. And I've heard some of the most sweet, sincere prayers. Simple. One of the most sweet and sincere prayers I ever heard was something like this, Lord, you know me.
Lord, I can't do it without you. Give me my sins and save me. And I want to tell you, that person that prayed that prayer was gloriously saved. Because to my knowledge to this day, they've never, never, never reverted back to their old ways. Because now they're walking in the light of the Lord. Do you know Him? Does He know you? If not, I challenge you to get right with Him today. Christian friend, remember there's a task that's set before you to preach the gospel to all nations before the end comes. And we look at this old world and what a sad shape, sad state of mind that it's in. And we think, how long, Lord? You know, we often pray as the Old Testament prophets, how long? How long, Lord, are you going to let this go on? Pull the pigs out of the pig pen. God may be just waiting on us to do what He's called us to do. You reckon? And this gospel shall be preached in all nations and then the end shall come. By the way, that's in the scriptures. Don't believe me. Look it up. You realize the number of unreached people groups of the gospel is getting more narrow every year? Just this last year, I believe they, uh, according to the International Mission Board, they reached another 95 unreached people groups of the gospel of Jesus. It's 95 that have never, 95 that have never heard the gospel before. Never heard the good news. And every year we hope and pray that that number gets slimmer and slimmer and slimmer because you know what? I'm ready to see the Lord. One of these days we shall see Him face to face. I open my prayers that we hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Friend, if you're here and God's calling you, Whatever it may be, maybe it's the mission service, maybe it's to serve in a local church, maybe it's a joint local church, whatever, whatever it may be, we'd be obedient to his call. And he promised to serve and bring glory to him. Let's stand together this morning as we pray. The music team comes. Lord, we thank you, Jesus that you've given us power to overcome sin, that you've given us the adoption for your precious blood that we might be called children of God. Lord, we thank you for the good news, the gospel of peace, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that only through him can we be saved. We pray now, Lord, during this time of Invitation, dedication, reflection. That every person in this place is found perfectly within your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you come this morning?